Um, hi, I'm Tom Clark. I'm a farmer. I'm also working on the NFU Net Zero Pledge. And uh, Happy New Year. So far, it hasn't been that happy a new year for farmers. We've had a former uh, DEFRA chief scientist um, call for 50% rewilding of the UK. We've had George Monbiot calling for an end to farming entirely this decade. And we've had Mark Avery state that farmers can't be trusted with the climate. Um, what, my question is, what can you say now, Secretary of State, to show that DEFRA gets it, DEFRA understands that farmers are a resource and an ally in these challenges? Bluntly, have you got our back? I have, yes. And I think it is vital to point out again and again, as Minette did only this morning, that well-managed, sustainable livestock production can be beneficial in tackling the challenges of biodiversity conservation and addressing climate change. This simplistic labeling of, of meat eating as, uh, as negative for the climate is not just simplistic, but when it comes to the standards we apply in this country, frankly, it's misleading. And therefore, I, I'm a strong supporter of uh, livestock farming in this country. Well, let's, uh, let's carry on with that theme. If anyone's got another question on exactly that, that topic, then it would be nice to continue. Gentlemen here, thank you. Theresa Villiers, we've heard a really great wish list, and that is all I think it is at the moment. What farmers require is assurances, not just a wish list. And one of the ones I would like to, to see is that you in your position will have control over organisations like Natural England, where we seem to have a preponderance of people who like woolly creatures, and we all like woolly creatures, but within certain rules and regulations, where the sum of several levels about three years ago were flooded to devastation. Why were they flooded to that degree? Because the waterworks had not been cleaned out because certain elements wanted trees to be growing in the middle of rivers. And what happened? All the woolly creatures, such as the, uh, uh, the, the water rats and that, were drowned because of very bad management. We seem to be allowed to get away, or minor organizations seem to be allowed to get away with an awful lot. And I would like to see that brought under control, please. All farmers would like to see that under control. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Minette, would you like to? No, I was, I'm sorry, <laughs> trying to relay a message to you <laughs> quietly. How, what about that, Theresa? I mean, obviously, management and policy has a direct effect, doesn't it, on management, especially when we're in volatile climate situations. We've had flooding this year as well. So how can you help change policy, which will cope with that? And well, cope well we obviously have a very substantial programme for investment in flood defences. Um, and it will always be vitally important for the Environment Agency to deploy the best uh, scientific evidence and expert advice on, on getting the balance right to ensure that we do everything that's feasible to protect people from flooding, at the same time as ensuring that we are meeting our conservation and biodiversity goals. But, as I focused on in my speech, I think in many instances, the, the, the farming and the environmental um, policies needn't be irreconcilable. There is shared ground that we can find in many of these instances, which will enable us to support farmers, run successful and productive farming businesses at the same time as meeting our environmental goals. There will be tensions, inevitably, but uh, I think in many instances that we can resolve them in a way which works for both sides. And Craig Bennett, of course, Friends of the Earth, you know, you're right there in the middle of it, talking to farmers and to conservationists as well. Have you got any answers? Yeah, I think all I'd say really uh, on the, the first question, I mean, I hope I made it clear in my speech that we do see that farmers can absolutely be a big part of the solution, essential to the solution. There isn't a solution unless we involve farmers and make it work and pay for farmers in all of this. Um, but what I would say, I just want to sort of comment uh, about the reaction I get sometimes from some parts of the, the, the sort of agricultural community, um, because it kind of reminds me a little bit of where the discussion was around fossil fuels 20 years ago. 
um, when you know someone like me would say something like, we've got to decarbonize our energy, and then I get accused of saying that we want to turn all the lights off and, and go back and living in caves. Uh, equally, Friends of the Earth has been really clear that we, we support eating less but better meat, and then I get told that I'm trying to make everyone vegan, which is not what I said at all, or that we say we need some rewilding in this country. You just have to keep saying what you're saying. Yeah, loud. exactly. And then they get told that we're trying to stop all farming in the whole country. And, and uh, I just think, actually, it's important to listen to the nuances. And I know there will be other voices out there advocating uh, other things as well. But I mean, a actually, it's important when you've got uh, organizations like Friends of the Earth and so on, Listen to, please listen to the detail of what we're saying and the nuances of it, because we are working with lots of farmers, particular nature-friendly farmers, to, to craft what we think is a positive way forward. Thank you very much. Next question. Sorry, we've got some numbers here. Who's, who's asking that one? Sorry, I can't see behind the podium. Hi there, yeah, I'm hidden right around the corner here. Uh, Will okay. Jackson, uh, Strategy Director for Beef and Lamb at HDB. Uh, just a quick question, a practical question, Secretary of State. You mentioned that the Ag Bill's going back to Parliament this month. Um, how do you, what sort of timeline do you envisage that will be before it gets passed through? Um, we certainly want to finish by, by the spring. So um, we're, we're hoping to get it finished by around May. March, April, Easter recess. Maybe. We will, we will be getting on with it as quickly as we possibly can. Um, we are very keen to finish by the spring. Has it changed very much? You said reformed, but is that, is, are there, there aren't any substantial differences to, to what it was before? The fundamentals are very much the same. As I say, there's an addition of additional provisions on food security and an, a number of other um, additions as well. And you said that it, there would be reports on food security regularly. How regularly? Um, I am struggling to remember the uh, reporting period, but it will be in the bill. Okay, we'll all have a look at that then. Uh, next question, please. Uh, lady here with glasses. Thank you very much. Um, Ellen McKay, Policy Advisor for Scottish Land and Estates and Farmers Pub Scholar. Considering the potential for policy divergence between the four nations, how likely is it that any future ag devolved budget is delivered with any strings attached, uh, especially in light of trade? And are we going to see any detail and common framework soon? So the difference between um, the four nations and trade deals especially, and, and any differences there? Well, I mean, there will be quite sort of big constitutional implications with attaching strings to money allocated under farm support systems. But uh, we will certainly have difficult issues to grapple with in terms of the fact that trade policy is reserved, but agriculture is devolved. And the only solution there is, is close working relationships with the devolved governments to, uh, to make those arrangements work in practice. We're going to have to try and build as much consensus across the uh, devolved administrations and Westminster. And we all know on food and farming, that's not going to be easy. We have a lot of Welsh, um, Northern Irish and, and uh, Scottish farmers here. You know, they do want to know that they will get as good a deal as, as anyone else. How, how sure are you that you'll be able to negotiate well with Scotland, say, who might be coming from quite a different angle? Well, I mean, the, the key thing is that we've guaranteed the overall level of farm support funding for this parliament. Obviously, in the longer term, in, on the question of allocation within the, the nations of the United Kingdom, those decisions haven't been taken. But you know, we are very strongly in favor of ensuring that we level up in our economy in all parts of the United Kingdom, that we support our farmers in all of the nations, and that will be something that drives our decision making when it comes to the future uh, approach to division of funds within the United Kingdom. Okay, next question, please. Uh, sorry, where are we on our numbers? Number four there? Yep, thank you. Hello, Tom Bradshaw, NFU. Um, we've heard about clean air, we've got the net zero commitment by 2050. Craig, you mentioned about fossil fuels and, re and reducing our reliance, and you also mentioned about the problems with soil imports. There's a solution which is in the palm of our hands, and that's bioethanol, which will help start the reduction of the um, carbon emissions. 
what we want to understand is why that there is no commitment yet to the E10 mandate and what is holding that up. Because we accept it's a journey. Electric is where we will end up. But we're not going to get 30 million cars, electric cars, on the road in the next five years. So we've got to start the transition and we've got to start the journey. How do you do that? Starting the journey with transition and cutting back. There's a question for you, Craig. Oh, was it? Yep. Oh, sorry, I thought it was a <laughs> well, state. It's, 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 well, it's both, it's because it's a political right. answer yeah. that will achieve it. Um, well, I, I have to tell you I'm pretty sceptical about biofuels and bioethanol, I'm afraid. I think where the evidence has existed from, from many places around the world, it is uh, what we would call a false solution. It creates many problems as well. I know there'll be people here that disagree with me on that, but I think there's plenty of evidence that that's the case. And actually, if uh, the farming community is happy, if you like, to give up land that is being used to grow food at the moment, uh, to grow energy crops, I would say, well, that's perfect land then used for growing trees, whether you do that through tree planting or even better through natural regeneration when you definitely get the right tree in the right place. So I'll take the opportunity to say that we also need to have payments in place to support natural regeneration, not just tree planting. So I'll, th I'll throw that in as well. But sorry, I'm sceptical about biofuels and bioethanol just on, a, on, a, on, on the evidence as to whether it really delivers on solving climate solutions. Teresa Villas. Well, I I think there, there is certainly a role for biofuels in meeting our emissions targets, but it, it, is, it is also true that it's a complex area, it's a contested area, and there are divided opinions about the idea of shifting more land use from food production to fuel production. But uh, I know that the 10 point is something that the Transport Secretary is actively looking at at the moment, and um, I will certainly be discussing it with him in the near future because I know that there are many in the farming community that think that this is another of the ways in which they can contribute to um, our carbon reduction targets. Next question. There's uh, number five over there. Yes, sir. You stand up. Thanks. Uh, David Hutchinson from Cambridgeshire, uh, Agronomy Advisors. Um, Craig, I share the vision of agriculture playing a key role in climate change mitigation and a sustainable future for society as a whole. But uh, do you recognise that crop protection products can also make a positive contribution to climate change mitigation? So, for example, if the approval for the use of glyphosate is not renewed when the current approval uh, expires in less than five years, there will be an inevitable increase in cultivations <laughs> and we will burn considerable quantities of fossil fuels and damage soil health and ecological balance. Yeah, and the, yes, there's also a GM question here on the app, which is how can removal of neonics be considered... Sorry, um, there's... I lost my place here. Um, would Friends of the Earth support the use of GM technology in crop production to help farmers reduce pesticide use and help reach net zero targets? So if you could address both of those, that would be great. So look, I would say surely the learning that we've had after 50, 60, 70 years of industrial agriculture is that it carries uh, many problems as, as well as obvious, the obvious benefits of uh, production, but it carries many problems with it. And I think what we have to learn from that is have a vision for agriculture that is working with nature rather than against it. And that we've got, to, we've got to stop seeing these things as very divided and that this bit of land here is only for this sole purpose and this bit of land here is for a different one. Um, that's why we need to see much more planting with companion cropping, for example. We need to see integrated pest management. Uh, we need to see mechanisms like the, the, the robot weeding that I was talking about before, which is coming to the market in the next couple of years. My concern is that we know that there were real problems with glyphosate. We know there's problems with neonicotinoids. I'll come to GM in a minute. Um, but we can't just dismiss those problems and think, oh, well, actually, we've, we've got to keep using the same old technology, the same old approaches that we know have huge uh, problems associated with them. Actually, there's a, there's a whole new paradigm for agriculture in the 21st century which we need, which is to learn from what worked well, but also learn from the problems of the 20th century and actually make sure that we can use agroecology and agroforestry methods to work in harmony with nature rather than against it. So um, many people here might think, well, actually, that just means less food. Well, I, um, I, I think the evidence is it doesn't have to mean that. It's, uh, you know, I've said very clearly, it's not all or nothing. I'm not saying that we ban all pesticides. It's about significantly reducing the amount of pesticides and herbicides we use, being much more targeted on it, 
um, and, and using, using technology actually to make sure it can be more targeted and not have oversupply. So it's not about all or nothing. Uh, but let's be more nuanced in the understanding and nuanced in the use of, of these uh, mechanisms as well. And then that comes to the point about genetically modified foods. Because I think, again, the point is what we've seen with GM foods around the world over the last 20 years, uh, they've consistently over-promised and under-delivered. Uh, actually, despite all the hype that we were hearing 10, 20 years ago about how there'd be a sort of great solution and so on, actually, most GM crops commercialized around the world now are for herbicide tolerance and actually simply prop up and exacerbate you know, overuse of those herbicides in many respects. And actually, what we're seeing is GM herbicide tolerance soy, maize, and oilseed rape have caused huge problems with weed resistance and farmers reporting to more and more damaging herbicides, uh, using, having to use more and more damaging herbicides in many parts of the world. So, you know, let's not just think that we can have these silver bullet fixes here. Uh, let's actually do learn from the last 50 years and work in harmony with nature and develop solutions to these kind of problems that, that go with the flow rather than try and uh, find silver bullets. Kim just wants to um, say yes, just, just very quickly on, on this point. Um, I think one of the, the things on a, from a trade perspective is to think about what the UK attitude to risk will be going mm. forward. And so I welcome the Secretary of State's uh, comments on about, um, for promoting high um, regulatory standards. That's very important. But what, what will our attitude to risk be? So will we be operating on the, on the EU's um, precautionary principle going forward, or will we be looking more to the US system where they, they tend to regulate on the basics of scientific assessments? So this is important for your trade agreements, and it's also important as how it plays out in WTO rules. So I just wanted to offer that. Okay. Do well, you want I, to talk about I, I, um, GM is I think that's still a key, there? I think still that's there, a key. Well, I think uh, surely, Craig. I mean, new plant breeding technologies are absolutely going to be the way to go. You know, with the changing weather events, with the big dynamics that we've got now, the droughts that we're facing. You know, new plant breeding technologies, R and D. You know, you've been talking about that. It's going to be absolutely key to the future. I think with pesticides, you know, we are measuring weight, we are measuring scale. We're not measuring the evidence base enough. You know, we're not measuring the impact enough. And that is what we need to be looking at. But there are real, really bright signs, bright sheets coming through. You look at the recent piece on moths, which absolutely showed, you know, really good stability. Moths are back to where they should be, and they are a key indicator. So I think we had to put all of this in perspective. You know, the EU is one of the most, the most highly regulated on pesticides in the world. And then, of course, we have CRD. So the UK at this moment in time is doing a blimmin' good job on the world stage because we are so highly regulated. Now, there's much more that we can do, and that is exciting. We need to all work together on that. But I think it's a really key question from Fiona on which approach we'll be taking. You know, Dominic Cummings has recently been talking about, you know, taking emotion out of this being absolutely evidence-based, science-based. That is what the NFU has driven all along, taking emotion out of the argument. Do you see that, Secretary of State, as the ambition um, for the future? Is what? GM on the cards? There we was will, a commitment. There we, was a commitment. We will always be it guided. Government policy. We will always be guided by the science. So um, our approach to licensing, to, to safety, to health, whether it's GM or whether it's the other pesticides, will be decided by the scientific <laughs> evidence. We await. So there the are decision. there are opportunities. In we this await area. the decision then, don't we? Okay. Next question, please. Um, oh, lady over here. Thank you. Um, good morning, Rachel Mailey Davis, uh, Kite Consulting by day, Hill Farmer by night. Um, <laughs> I've got a question for you, Professor Smith, regarding trade. Um, although the details so far are quite vague in terms of public good delivery, how likely or feasible is it that we can shoehorn it via the amber box should we end up on the WTO tariffs? Sorry, could if you, you, sorry, if you can speak <laughs> rather quickly. If you oh, just say sorry. That. I missed the last bit about sorry. the amber box. How likely, do, although we have, don't have a great deal, amount of detail about public goods um, delivery at the moment, but how feasible is it that that can be, the payments can be shoehorned via the amber box should we end up on the WTO? Okay, so do, do you want to respond? The amber box. <laughs> yes, right. Okay, so the, the joy of the boxes, um, I, I, I love this. Um, so if you, th if you think of subsidies as red, as red uh, amber, and green like traffic lights, red you can't do. Amber, we'd really rather you didn't. And green, yeah, go for it. 
And the agriculture agreement works on exactly the same principles. So amber box is, we'd really rather you didn't have these subsidies, but we acknowledge that you do, but we'd really like it if you didn't have them anymore, so do you cap them. So that, that's a very simplistic explanation, and those of you who want more, I can go into it. So the trouble with, um, so very, very quickly, the trouble with the amber box is the amber box allocation is for product-specific subsidies. In other words, these are payments to farmers to farm cattle or to grow crops. So they're geared to production. They're, these types of subsidies are capped. These subsidies were negotiated when the WTO came into effect in 1995, and only certain countries have amber box allocations, the EU being one. Now, as the, the UK being a member of the EU has always had access to that amber box sort of entitlement, but there's been a real question about what happens when uh, we leave the EU, what happens to that. Now, hopefully, we'll get a share of that amber box, which will mean that any payment for public goods, if it can't be under the green, uh, green box, i.e., that's OK, just go ahead, let's not worry about it. Um, if we get a share of the amber box, then it, a sort of subsidy that doesn't quite fit should be OK under amber box. But, but I would that, say... Does that mean a hill farmer might be able to get some... Uh, <sighs> funding under public money for public goods because they're doing extensive well, ill farming again, in an environmental way. Again, in the that box. decision about who gets what is a political decision for, for a government, for a secretary of state. But from a WTO point of view, um, there's less concern if the UK has this amber box allowance because then it just means there's lots more flexibility with the way that subsidies um, can be paid. But what I would say is always remember that it's not about full autonomy of what the UK can and cannot do. There are 164 members of the WTO. Everybody will be watching. Um, so even if the payments are made, there may be discussion in WTO Committee on Agriculture about the scope of these subsidies and what, what should happen going forward. Okay, thank you. Would you like I mean, to make a comment? I are, you, are you keen to support, still support farmers who have actually only survived because they are getting some subsidy because they are farming in extremely difficult conditions and in areas of the country where it is very, very difficult to make a living. Are you committed to keeping supporting them? Well, I believe that ELM will provide them with opportunities, so they're in a strong position to take part in these schemes. So absolutely, I foresee us continuing to support them. And when it comes to our WTO obligations, um, it's correct that it's, um, you know, it's not necessarily straightforward to provide any sort of support to any kind of sector. But the reality is that more or less all developed economies around the world recognize the special status of agriculture and food production. So more or less every developed country around the world finds a way to do this, which is legal within our WTO obligations. And I'm absolutely convinced that the schemes that we are working on will be compliant with our obligations under WTO and other international commitments. Minette, are you worried about the future for support for people? I think we're spending, we're spending quite a lot of time talking about the money, and, and I really appreciate the efforts that you have gone to uh, to secure the budget for the term of the next parliament. But the, the budget is really secondary, completely secondary, and if I'm honest, completely meaningless compared to trade. And what I want to know is how. You've said some great things on welfare Indeed, so is the Prime Minister and many other people about maintaining our standards and a lot of talk of raising our standards. And we have no idea, literally weeks away from trade discussions, about the how. And I would really like you to just briefly outline how. Mm. Well, we've, we've put it in our manifesto that we're going to be defending our standards of food safety, food security, animal welfare and the environment. And that is what we will take to the negotiating table in our trade negotiations. And you will walk away from the table, you said, if our standards are at risk of being undermined. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there will be pressure in these negotiations to, you know, on, on agriculture. There always is. It's, it's notorious that agriculture is the last chapter to close in any trade deal. I just want but to take a, that take that a little poll um, of people here. How convinced are you of all these arguments that the government really is going to protect your interests 
in carrying out a trade deal, for instance, with the United States. None of you are convinced that the government will back you, will have your back, as was said earlier. The, Good luck. It's a manifesto. Yeah. <laughs> But it's her saying the specific, Anna, is what I said in my speech. The, the specific element below the headlines then is, will you, will you uh, agree to a trade deal that allows food to be imported from other countries that's produced to lower standards? That actually break our rule. Yeah. Well, we want to ensure that all the food that comes into our country is, meets our standards, and which meets standards which, is, which are as good as ours. We believe that is very, very important. But wanting to ensure isn't the same as saying we will stop food produced at lower standards from coming in. But we will have an armory of tariffs that we can use to make sure that we maintain our high standards here. We don't undercut those high standards with imports from low welfare jurisdiction. That's what the powerful tools of, of the WTO enable us to impose tariffs where we don't believe that the standards to which food is produced is sufficient to there meet ours. Be, there will be tariffs on products that don't meet our standards. Let's take another question from the floor because we're here for the delegates. Yes, lady here. Uh, good morning. Question for the Secretary of State, Mark Bridgman, Northumberland farmer and president of the CLA. And we welcome what you were saying about Elms, the idea that it'll be bottom-up driven, <laughs> one, uh, not one-size-fits-all and farmer-led. But the schemes aren't really going to be fully operational until the end of 2014, 2015. Um, but you also said we're going to do a managed and fair transition. Could you put a bit of um, detail on that as how you see that transition taking place when we're going to start, you're going to start reducing BPS next year, 21, how that might feed through, because what obviously we're all concerned about is that viable businesses will be put under undue pressure um, in that transition. Thank you. We will be setting out more detail on this, on how the direct payments transition will operate in the policy statement that I announced would be published with the Agriculture Bill which will be back in Parliament within the next fortnight or so. OK. Um, let's take one question for another question from the floor. Jim? Stephen so, Fell, so Stephen Yorkshire Fell. and Leaf Farmer. Um, we, nice and brief, please. Uh, it will be. Thank you. Um, <laughs> no, it's just the time is, know, the time know, is running well, out. You've, you've now taken up 30 seconds of my question. <laughs> um, many farmers are concerned about being uh, a soft target in the climate change debate. Mm. Part of the problem, I believe, is a plethora of dubious statistics where, for example, farming is responsible for between 10 and 50 percent of carbon emissions. Now, will you, will you Secretary of State, uh, endorse some of the work being done by AHDB and indeed the NFU, which is producing some really interesting stuff about reduction in uh, livestock numbers uh, increase in productivity, but reduction in carbon. Can you give us an assurance that we will start to have the proper statistics coming out that people can take um, a heart from and advice from? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I think we need to, to base this hotly contested debate on, on food on, on the facts. And uh, as I mentioned before, there's, there are many facts thrown around which are entirely incorrect. We need to operate on the basis of the factual situation, and as I said, um, well-managed sustainable livestock production can actually play a very positive role, both in protecting nature and averting climate change. Uh, question down here, Will. Uh, hi, Will Evans, farmer, North East Wales. Um, you mentioned improving the health and welfare of animals as well as improving productivity in UK Ag during your talk, Secretary of State. I'd suggest that this will be extremely difficult if we don't get on top of bovine TB, which is certainly the biggest challenge facing many farmers on the ground, certainly in my part of the world. Um, and, and you mentioned just a few minutes ago following the science. Can you therefore explain your decision to stop the badger cull in Derbyshire lately? The Derbyshire decision was um, to give us more time to look at the interaction between um, culling and badger vaccination mechanisms. Um, because of the proximity of the vaccination projects in Derbyshire with the cull that was due to start. 
Um, but I want to reiterate what I've said many times, is that the government believes that uh, tackling bovine TB is one of the biggest threats to animal health in our country is vital, and that we have a multi-stranded approach, which of course um, covers vaccination projects, but we also continue to believe that badger control mechanisms um, are playing a significant and important role in addressing bovine TB and eliminating it. Well, Derbyshire was a problem, wasn't it? And, and was that just badly managed then? We accept um, it was very unfortunate. The decision was so soon before the cull was due to start. But um, as I've said, the, the key concern was to give us more time to look at the interrelationship between badger control mechanisms and badger vaccination as a means to control bovine TB. All right. Um, we have a question over here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ali Jones, and if you come, Ray. Um, forgive me, but I need to go back um, because that was a very critical moment in this meeting this morning. When asked by the audience for a show of hands and confidence and that our trade and standards we protected, there were zero hands shown in the audience, and that's critical. Now then, the government was asked whether they would establish a commission on trade and standards, which would be independent and transparent. If that commission were to be set up, I guarantee you there'd be many hands put up here this morning. Now, will you guarantee or commit to set up this commission? Because we've asked consistently, and your predecessor was nearly at the point of signing this commission to be established. Thank you very much indeed. And something that Manette mentioned on the Today programme this morning, the commission, will it be set up? If so, when? Well, I, as I've said publicly, I, I can see that this is, this is potentially an effective means to ensure that we have appropriate scrutiny and working relationships between government and farmers and experts on our trade discussions. But we continue to have this debate within government about whether that is the mechanism we are going to adopt or not. There are a number of groups already established to engage between government and business, including farming, on trade negotiations. But I will take your message and Minette's message back to my colleagues in government as we decide whether a Trades Council needs to be set up afresh or whether we should just continue to use the existing working groups. But what I will emphasize is that we will be listening to farmers as we conduct our trade negotiations. That engagement will be crucial whether it takes place via a new trade council or commission, or whether it takes place through existing bodies. You say you'll take back the message from one farmer and from Minette. Remember, no hands went up. Yep. You have to take that message back from every single person in this room, I think, as well. Right, let's have um, another question. We've got one over here. Sorry, thank you. Um, I hesitate to say that I'm another fell, but I'm from Northumberland. Uh, it's a question for Minette. Minette, you exhorted the Secretary of State to procure British, but I wonder how many of us in this room actually walk the talk. When we analyze our shopping baskets, how many of us are really buying British? Oh, let's I'll, have a show of hands in a minute. Finish your question. And are we evangelical enough when we're talking in the shops and when we're eating in the restaurants? Thank you very much indeed. Let's just have a quick show of hands. Who does the shopping every week? Yeah, not very many. Oh, you do? Okay. Who looks at the label and chooses and buys British? Always. Okay, not bad, not bad. If you put your hand up, okay. <laughs> Minette, would you like to answer? <laughs> Look, um, I, I have had the... Um, there's Jim Mosley here, who is um, the chief executive of Red Tractor. It's been a great privilege for me to be on the Red Tractor board um, for the past five years now. And I have very much worked and supported the ambition to go to a one-stop assurance. And I'm, I, I hope I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it anyway. But I think we will soon have uh, a British organic model, which is really, really exciting. And it will mean that we can totally fulfill the balanced scorecard 
uh, for procurement for our hospitals, for our schools, for our MOD, rather than following things like the school food plan, which have been brilliant, but it's meant in order to get to gold, we've been bringing in uh, organic uh, carrots and things like that, organic produce from abroad. And this way we will be able to get to British wherever possible and cover off that balanced scorecard. So it's why I asked the Secretary of State. We heard big commitments uh, from the Prime Minister. It was a manifesto commitment on procurement. And it's why I asked, in the very beginning, I'm writing to all the retailers, I'm writing to all food service, I'm writing to Out of Home, asking them, will they make sure that we maintain our red tractor standards, we don't import food below the legal baseline of UK production? So it's a really important question. I will be writing to the Department of Health, I will be writing to the MOD, uh, Education uh, and others to ask them that question. Um, so I think this sits at, at the heart of all this. Will we maintain our food values in procurement? Because we are not at the moment. Um, and actually the buying contracts for the NHS are incredibly low. They have dropped again. They're nearly down to 350 for three core meals. So if we're going to be getting the journey back to health with high quality British food, we have to look at what we're eating. And it's so frustrating that food just doesn't get mentioned. We mention food in the Yemen because they are starving in the Yemen. And here we are in the UK where we just take it for granted. And this is a reset moment. And it should start with government. They should put their money, dare I say it, where their mouth is, start with procurement and deliver on it and do it now. Well done. It is 11 o'clock. This is your last chance to uh, raise the mood here and make a big Commit. commitment. Commit. Commit. <laughs> make a big commitment to the better The commitment is absolutely Britain. we need to do more on this. We have a manifesto commitment to encourage more to buy British, and that's exactly what we'll be doing. You said you've got a lovely, great big majority now. It's almost like you can do anything you want. Will you commit to that to actually, you know, you are pivotal in this because you have to talk to Treasury, you have to talk to Health, yes. you have to talk to Transport, you, are, you have Environment with you, you have Farming with you. You must pull these threads together to help these people create what they want to create and trade what they want to trade. Can you make a commitment to support farmers so that they can make things happen during transition and after transition, post-Brexit, that actually those sunny uplands that I talked about at the beginning might start to appear for them. Of course I will be backing farmers and of course throughout government we, we're working to ensure that we do everything to drive people to ensure that that balanced scorecard that we've introduced on Buying British actually delivers. We believe that this is a country that produces some of the best quality food in the world. We want to promote it both at home and, of course, crucially, across the world as well. well thank you all very much for asking so many great questions. Uh, thank you to our speakers as well. You've got half an hour for a coffee now. Uh, but if you'd like to thank our speakers. Thank you.